Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. Now, I was saying to you last time that the Old Testament has some examples that we learn from. And I said last week that there are some things that are common to all of us. There hath no temptation taken you, but just as is common to man. And of course, what Randy was saying earlier is that there's a common temptation for all men. And all men, of course, have a problem in this area if they have an ability, for instance, in pornography. They want to stay clear of that. You have to be able to renew your mind. You have to make some changes in your life. There's some common temptations and common lusts that seem to be a part of all lives and all churches. Our goal is to have communion with the Lord. Our goal is to spend time with Him, to have fellowship with Him. Now, having said that, there are common things that we have in common with sin, but there are some things that are common that bring us together as a fellowship of churches or as a fellowship of a church. And the most important things that we, that we have in common, according to this passage, is the communion of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, I understand that when, when it's mentioned here that we're united by the blood of Jesus Christ, I want you to understand that usually the body is broken first. This is my body, and then the blood is, is, is given le- second. But in the passage that you're looking at in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the communion involves first and, fi- and, and primary the blood of Jesus Christ. There are three major themes in this passage having to do with commonality. First one, of course, we're united and dedicated to Christ in, in the blood of Christ, in the, blood, in, the, in the broken bread, the body of Christ. The Israelites were one people. They're an illustration, united. They had commonality by the service at the altar to the same God. They were partakers of the same altar. And then also this idea of commonality. Is there anything common? Is there any communion between Christ and and the table of demons. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. That's our introduction. Our first point, of course, the cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Now, I said this to you last week, but I want to start off with this just by way of of bringing you up to speed again, that every single person in this world has a disease of the blood. We have a blood disease. Honestly, it was passed on to us by our parents. Our parents, when they gave birth to us, gave birth to us as a blood disease. Now, in the Bible we see this. It says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. But I want you to notice, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Do you see that? If that is true, if the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I die... That means there's something wrong with the blood that is not able to give life to the flesh. Because the way I live is by this blood. The the life of the flesh is in the blood. If you take the blood out of a person, he's going to die because that's the source of all life. And of course, the problem is when you die, you understand that there's a problem here. This blood is is an issue for most people that die. It's going to be a blood issue of some type. Now anyway, what I'm saying is we have this disease of our blood, and that blood is a huge problem. The Bible says, and according to the law, all things are purified with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. The blood is the agent of cleansing. We needed a transfusion of a different type of blood. Now frankly, folks, you could give me blood, I could give you blood, and you would live for a period of time with the transfusion of blood. But the blood from you or the blood from me is still diseased blood. And so if I gave you my blood or you gave me your blood, we would still die. Because all of us have this problem in our blood because the life of the flesh is in the blood and because we die. But there is one, and what we understand is he still has blood today in existence in the temple in heaven that's anointing the mercy seat in heaven. 
We believe the literal blood of Christ, the actual blood of Christ, is in heaven. Because Jesus' blood was not decayed, it was not corrupt. Jesus did not have sin in his body, he did not have a disease of the blood. And if he had not had that blood pour from his side, he would have lived forever on this earth in a physical body. Because Jesus was not subject to sin and the wages of sin is death. Because our blood has a disease of sin, we die. The wages of sin is death. Because Jesus had not died, he would not have died. He would have lived physically, he would have lived forever. When the blood was taken from him, he died upon that cross. But that blood is still in effect today and it's given to anyone who would put their trust in Christ. That literal blood of Christ is on the mercy seat in heaven and it makes atonement for your sin and for my sin. Literally, it's, the blood is applied to me. It's applied to my life and it is through the blood of Christ. Now listen, there are a lot of minors in Christianity. There's a lot of minors in major things unity and minor things liberty and all things charity. There's a lot of things that we have to agree on. There's a lot of things we will disagree on. But there's one thing that's probably more important than anything else, and it's how are you going to be saved? The blood of Christ is critical to Christianity. The blood of Jesus Christ is critical. It's, it's not only important, it's, it's fundamental. It has to be the blood of Jesus Christ. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Jesus Christ had to die upon the cross, which means... Unless you are under the blood of Christ, you cannot be saved. Unless you experience the death of Jesus Christ for your sin, you cannot be saved. Sacraments cannot get you to heaven, no blood involved. Your baptism cannot get you to heaven, no blood involved. The only thing that can get you to heaven is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the blood that makes atonement for our, for our sins. Once again, I'm telling you about the blood of Christ as a major. When you take communion, I want you to understand that you're preaching this message. When we read again in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, when we, when a chapter, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, I'm going to skip over one chapter. It says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death, you show the Lord's death, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come. The word show in the King James is rightly translated proclaim. This, it is 17 times, you can picture, it's, it's used 10 times in the, in the, in the, uh, the Bible, it, 10 times it is pro, the word preach in the authorized version. 10 times it is used for the word preaching. So you to show or you preach the Lord's death until you come. When we have the Lord's table and we have it in front of us and we take the cup, we are preaching a message. It is the blood. When we break the blood, bread, we are preaching a message. This is the blood or the body of Jesus Christ which is broken for me. We're proclaiming, we're proclaiming a message. Now, having said that, I want you to notice this. When you were baptized, you were also proclaiming a message. Do you know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Do you realize that baptism and the Lord's table communion are both about death? Both of them are about death. You understand that baptism is about his death for us. That when I am baptized, when I go under the water, I am saying, His death was for me and I died with Him. When we talk about baptism, I died with Him. When we talk about the Lord's table, He died for me. Baptism, I died with Him. Again, it is about our death with Christ. Our fellowship communion is about our death of Christ. Baptism is about the death with Christ. Now, there's, it's similar... But baptism is all about because his death is with, I died with him, I don't have this old nature empowering me anymore because I died with Christ. And therefore, I should walk in a new type of life. Now again, 
People don't like the idea of death as being the midpoint of what our religion is about. It's, it's gross. It's about blood. It's about bo torn bodies. It's about thorns on the brow. It's about blood coming down the forehead. It's about a hole in the side. That's what our faith is about, is death. Yes, it is. Our faith is about dying to self. It is all about death. And you will not have joy in your life apart from death. You want to live your life your way and you do not want to have the death of Christ to become a part of your life, then you will struggle. Our communion revolves around every person in this room not only having Christ died, dying for us, but we died with Him. In order for us to have communion and fellowship one with another, not only does Christ die for us, but we die with Him. We have to. Now let me explain how this works. You have a young gal in the church, and she decides that she wants to date someone who says he's a Christian. Or you have a young man in your church, and your young man falls in love with some girl who says she's a Christian. She doesn't go to church. She has no desire to read her Bible, but she says she's a Christian. And the young man comes and says, I am going to marry this gal because she says she's a Christian. Well, does she go to church? Well, she doesn't go very often, but she, her parents go to a church. They get married. There is a good chance that this girl is not saved. Or in the case of a man, it's a good chance that this man is not saved. The Bible is very clear, by their fruits you shall know them. You cannot tell if they're a Christian because they say they're a Christian. If they haven't died to self, if they're not walking in a newness of life, it is impossible for you to know whether they're a Christian. And so shortly after their marriage, shortly after they're married, and you're, you're following me, I hope, because we live in a country, in a state of Minnesota, that this happens all the time. The family of the husband or the, or the, the, the woman, the unsaved person or nominal Christian says, you need to baptize your children into the church. Well, we don't believe in baptizing children. Well, if you want to have a part of our family, you need to baptize your children into our church. Well, doesn't do any harm, does it? Okay, so I will, we'll have our children baptized into this other church. So this baby is baptized and becomes some faith or some different religion. They say they're a Christian. Friends, one of the things this passage is so strong about is you don't have fellowship. You can't have fellowship. There's nothing common without the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ not only cleanses us from our sin, but the blood of Jesus Christ also cleanses us from daily sin where we can die with Him, where we're buried with Christ by our baptism unto death. But like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of God, by the power of God, so we should walk in newness of life. You can't tell if a person's a Christian unless there is a transformation in their life. If there's no change that's taken place, you cannot tell if they're a Christian. Now God may be able to see their heart. He may know that this person's a Christian. But what happens if you date and you marry someone who says they're a Christian, but they're not? Now here... Part of, my, part of the issue according, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 is this. It says, For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Satan does not come across with a red suit and a forked tail and a pitchfork. He does not wear a red suit. The way he's depicted is not how he comes across. 
he comes across as a very, very nice man. A very nice person. He is an angel of light, right? But he's also a roaring lion, and he's also a dragon that wants to devour. So not only do you have this angel of light, but you also have this dragon, and you also have this lion. Satan does not just wear one hat. And so you find and you date this person who says they're a Christian, they can be very, very nice, but there's also a part of their, of their life, their, 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 their life that's not transformed, that's a lion, that's a dragon. And you raise your children and you have this integration between the, the ta table of the devil and the table of the Lord, you have this integration. Your children have to make a decision somewhere. They have to make a decision between what you say, the blood of Jesus Christ, the fact that Jesus died on the cross for you, that you accept Christ, or the fact that they were brought into this church by their baptism as a little infant. And they have to make some choice. Here's the problem. <laughs> Most of the time, a person will want to choose what allows them to live life their own way. That doesn't make demands on them to change. People do not want to be under thou shalt not. There are just too many demands on a Christian to have to have a changed life. We don't like that. And therefore, oftentimes children in that type of situation choose the wrong path. We're talking about integration between the, the table of the Lord and the table of the devil. I want you to take your Bible, please, and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm so far behind my notes on this sheet that I don't even think I'm going to try to catch up. I think I'm just going to let it be for this time. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, please. And I want you to look at verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what's the answer to that? What's the answer? No one wants to say anything. Zero. There is no fellowship, right? And what communion does light have with darkness? The answer? Nothing, right? Zero. What conquered, or, and what conquered hath Christ with Belial? Well, the answer is nothing. What part does he have who believes with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? What is the answer to all of that? Well, there's nothing. Now, Israel could have commonality at the idol, at, at the part, at the at the altar at the, the altar they could have commonality they had the same altar Christians they, they can have commonality but you say well wait a second we share the same house we share the same car we share the same bed we share everything in common God is saying no there's nothing nothing in common between righteousness and unrighteousness in the same way there's nothing in common between light and darkness Light is the absence of darkness, and darkness is the absence of light. Would you agree with that? Therefore, what God is saying here is that no matter what happens in your life, we have to realize that we must be separated, and we have to be careful in the decisions we make because we think we can have commonality, we cannot. I want you to look back at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 again, and I want to share this next verse here. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says in verse 21, You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of de demons. You cannot be partaker of the Lord's table and the te table of demons. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy or we're stronger than He? Just You can kind of picture this. I mean, it's not, not rocket science, but... 
you suppose that you are engaged to this gal. She loves you very much. But every Saturday night, it's her night to go dating someone else. It means nothing. She still loves you, but she likes dating. She enjoys going out with other guys. It means nothing. Now, I understand she kisses him goodnight, but it means nothing. She still loves you. Would that be a problem to anyone? <laughs> you know, obviously this is an issue when the Bible says you can't serve God and mammon. You cannot do it. You can't have two lords. No man can serve two masters. You can't do it. But would this be a problem? Now, you say, well, I love the Lord with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of our, my mind. Well, that sounds wonderful. When was the last time you read your Bible? Well, it's been a while. I don't know where it is right now exactly. I think it may be under the back seat of the car. You can't get under the back seat of your car. Okay. How much time have you spent watching football games lately? Well, not that much. I mean, I've only watched like four games this last week. You know, 12 hours or whatever of football games. Okay. 12 hours of football this last week and zero hours of Bible reading this week. Okay. Is there a problem to anybody here? You think this is an issue? My, my dilemma is this. We have commonality with people. There's commonality between people. And we have commonality because we both like Minnesota Twins, or we both like the Minnesota Vikings, or in some cases we both like Michigan, or we both like Ohio State, or no, for, we won't go there. We both like a different team, okay? And we, we have commonality. The degree of that commonality is based upon the degree of the passion for that thing, right? The more passionate you are, the more commonality you have. If you meet another person who is as passionate about Michigan football as you are, you're going to have commonality there. If you are passionate about riding horses and you meet someone else that's passionate about riding horses, you're going to have some really commonality there because your passion determines the degree of your fellowship, your concord, your relationship. It's all about how passionate you are towards something. Now, if you are not passionate towards something, you will not have a lot of commonality, concord, agreement, fellowship. You won't have much if you're not passionate about it. Most relationships on this earth are not about God. They're not about fellowship with Him. But again, today was supposed to be about communion, and we were talking about having communion with the Lord this is something that should just be incredibly passionate that we want to have fellowship with Him. I want to fellowship him, with Him and you want to fellowship with Him. We want to pray together. And when that happens, folks, you understand we have fellowship with God, we have fellowship with each other. Our fellowship with each other is going to be based upon that. On whether we have fellowship with one another. It says this in verse 23, all things are lawful for me, all things are not helpful. Just want to Stop with this one thought. I think it's very, very important. The word there, sum fero, in the Greek, sum fero, you don't need to worry about it. The word fero means to bear or to carry. The word sum means to carry with someone, to bear it with someone. It's not expedient. What it ha talks about is this. Do I care about the burdens of other people? Or am I only concerned with my own burdens, my own thoughts? Is life only about me? I am going to give you the most basic definition of sin there is. Sin is self-centeredness. Sin is all about being selfish. Sin is about what's in it for me. That's what sin is. Sin is caring about myself more than I care about anybody else. And what I want to do is really paramount in this world. The reason I say that, and again, Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray, we've turned everyone to his own way. I want my own way. I want it my way. I want to do it my way. I want to do what I want to do. In my life, I don't want to go to church. I don't like going to church because they want me to do it a different way and I want to do my own way. I want to do life. I want my life to be enjoyable. And it's about me. 
And if I don't enjoy it, I don't want to go to church. And it's really what's taking place in America in the world that we live in. And again, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we just read a few verses. Love, verse 4, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love vaunts not itself, is not puffed up. That says something right there. It vaunts not itself, is not puffed up. Does not behave itself unseemly. It does not seek its own or her own is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, rejoices not in iniquity. Now you can imagine a a guy and a girl are dating and the guy wants to have sex with this girl and they're not married and he says, but I love you. He doesn't love her. That's not a definition according to 1 Corinthians 13. It's not love. It's lust. The problem is in the world today people don't know the difference. It's not love. Because love is not about me. It's about caring for the other person and wanting what's best for them. And it's not rejoicing in iniquity. It's not doing something that's unseemly or unkind. It's not rejoicing in iniquity. Therefore, that is not love. If you want them to partake in something sinful in your life, it's not love. It's about you. Once again, my problem is this. We can have teaching from the pulpit or we can have transformation from the pulpit. And in my ministry over these last 40 years has been a whole lot too much about teaching and not enough about transformation. Lives need to change. We need to change and realize that it's not about me. It's not about what's best for me. This church no longer meets my needs. What's that have to do with it? You don't come to church to have your needs met. You come to church to meet the needs of other people, to care for other people, to love people. It really is not about you. When we worship God, it's not, oh, I love that song. I love the, song, the way that's, that sounds. It's not about that. Your worship is about other people. It's about helping them worship a, a holy God. It's about bringing them before the throne. It's about praying for them. It's about praying for people who are hurting. It's about caring for other people. And what a church is, it's a body of believers that have commonality through the blood of Christ and through the fact that that death was not only for you, but you also died with Him. The transformation is that I don't want to live my life for myself. I want to live it for my my wife. I want to live it for my kids. I want to live it for my parents. I want to live it for my friends. I want to care for them more than I care for myself. That's transformation. Because listen to me, it goes so contrary to what we are by nature. It's so different than what we are by nature. God does not want you to think every man on his own things. Philippians chapter 2, think every man on the things of others. To care for other people. To be about other people. To be about your neighbor. To be about your kids. To be about your wife. To be about your husband. He wants you to be about other people, not about yourself. I want to thank you for tuning into our program. It's been a delight to have you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask him that he might be your savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today. 